Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Happy Wednesday. Um, I'm Julie Flygar. I'm the president and CEO of Project Sleep, and I am joining you from Los Angeles and really excited to have Chad Ruoff. Hey, Dr. Ruoff, how are you? Hello, hello. Where are you joining us from? Uh, in Arizona, Scottsdale, Arizona. It's a little warm today. Mm, I bet. And hi, Lauren. Lauren's our hi. program manager. Where are you? Uh I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia. How is it there? Um, my computer says it's 76 and sunny. But... Nice, very nice. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for joining. I'll go ahead and pull up our, um, our slides if I can find them. Oh, geez. Well, hold on. Oh, there it is, aha. See, share. Okay, today we're really excited to talk about types of narcolepsy, um, trying to better understand narcolepsy type one versus type two versus idiopathic hypersomnia. It can be really, really confusing. And so we're just really excited to have this discussion, especially to have Dr. Ruoff walk us through this topic today. Lauren, you wanna go ahead and do some housekeeping? Yeah, so um, thank you everybody who's tuning in today. Um, as you join us, uh, we love to see where everybody is. So if you'd like to share your state or country that you're tuning in from, um, you can also share your brand of nerdiness if you like. Um, please like, comment, and share this video so we um, reach more people with it. Um, and just remember that the video is being recorded and the comments are public and will stay with the video. So only share things that you're comfortable with. Everybody seeing. Um, please send any questions you have um, for Dr. Ruoff in the comments. Um, and just remember that the Nerd Alert broadcasts are for uh, edu educational purposes and um, we can't give any medical advice. So if there's anything that comes up that sparks questions for you about your own situation or health condition, um, we ask that you would just bring those to your healthcare provider. Um, and then after the broadcast, we'll be uh, creating a toolkit together that is going to distill the information and insights shared today. Um, so look for that to come soon. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. And actually, maybe we should make a special fun announcement because I don't think we'll have another nerd alert before this happens. So I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Um, even though we didn't talk about this, um, we will be turning the nerd alerts also into podcasts. So in case you are a podcast person, as opposed to a broadcast person, you will, um, starting in July at some point, um, we will start rolling out the um, discussions that we're having here in a podcast, Project Sleeps podcast. So um, look forward to that as well. Uh, just want to reach people in many ways as possible. So um, for today, we're so excited to have Dr. Chad Ruoff, who is, um, I'm lucky to call a friend um, and a sleep medicine specialist at Mayo Clinic. Um, and I do not have your bio in front of me, I'm sorry, because of all these screens. So um, I'm just gonna go ahead and go with that. And why don't we dive into the discussion? Thank you, thank you. All right, so let me share my screen. Make sure I grab the right one. I look okay, guys. Perfect. Good. All right. So thank you so much, uh, Project Sleep, for having me. Uh, excited to be here, and hopefully I can um, add some clarity and maybe a little bit of confusion, confusion to the picture, but hopefully at the end, a little bit more clarity for you, uh, the patient and caregivers. So um, start with just some obligatory slides when we talk about this uh, subject. So, you know, really today we're going to be talking about the top two here. Uh, narcolepsy type one, type two, and idiopathic hypersomnia. We're certainly not going to touch upon Klein-Levin syndrome. That is an entity in of the self. And, um, but, you know, hypersomnia due to a medical disorder, hypersomnia due to a medical medication or substance, hypersomnia associated with a psychiatric disorder. disorder these are the challenges in di diagnosing and differentiating these top three. Um, so, so we, while we won't talk about these, this is really what makes uh, you know, coming up with a diagnosis uh, uh, challenging. 
in, in collecting the clinical history and whatnot. Insufficient sleep, well, that's um, fairly self-explanatory. I mean, and it's certainly something we're, we're concerned about more and more, um, just not getting enough sleep, social jet lag, you know, not getting enough sleep during the week and then catching up on the weekend. And then the whole Sunday night, that's where some patients, people might in general have trouble falling asleep that night because they spent the whole weekend catching up on sleep. And so trying to normalize that sleep across the seven day uh, week um, rather than the two day weekend playing catch up. And then normal variants, but then long sleeper, this is another one. So um, long sleepers is if, if they're given enough time to actually sleep and, and can ignore the societal pressures and whatnot, they feel fine if they get that. So, you know, whether it's insufficient sleep that we're concerned about or long sleep, really the, 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 the recommendation there is extend the sleep and see what it does for you. And I don't think I have a slide on this and it just came to mind, but with, with, with hypersomnolent uh, patients with hypersomnia, one of the really important thing, like with insomnia patients, we want to define that optimal duration where they're not spending hours and hours laying in bed. So that makes the perception of sleep worse, right? The typical thing if someone's having trouble sleeping at night is to extend the time to get to that magical seven to eight hours of sleep. Um, with hypersomnia, it's really what I recommend um, for patients is to define that, that optimal duration. What is that? Well, it's where if you go over that, you don't feel any better, but if you go under, you feel worse. And that can be really important, especially for some of the uh, patients with long sleep or longer sleep, um, you know, trying to get by with maybe an hour less of sleep every day. That's huge to get an hour back. If you can really, you know, um, diligently do this kind of um, uh, trial and say, well, I, you know, I, I usually get 10, but I think I'm, I feel the same with nine actually. Um, so that's really an important point. And um, the power of another hour during the day would be <laughs> invaluable. But Dr. You're Ruff, me. Yeah. Um, well, I usually don't always jump in with questions so early, but <laughs> I yeah. was wondering too, um, you know, where in the process of trying to diagnose someone with a hypersomnia, do you think that uh, clinicians are considering other things outside of um, hypersomnias as well? Um, you know, like other autoimmune conditions that might cause, um, you know, we always think of how it takes so long for anyone with, um, these conditions to get to a sleep specialist, but at the same time, uh, I have heard of some cases where someone ended up with a, a lupus diagnosis that, um, had been missed for many years and actually got on treatment for that and felt that their sleepiness resolved. So do you know how much they consider other things too? I think it's important. And I, I, you know, when I see a patient, it's always, you know, talking, making, I always encourage um, um, uh, patients to talk about their fatigue, sleepiness with all healthcare providers and make sure that they're not missing something. I mean, I've had, certainly that, that can be uh, lupus, MS, MS has rampant fatigue, um, which fatigue and sleepiness, sometimes even with a, a person in front of you, when you're trying to dissect, is it fatigue or is it sleepiness? Sometimes it can be challenging. Um, yes, sleepiness is the tendency to fall asleep and fatigue is this tired, exhausted feeling, but not nodding off. But gosh, sometimes it, it can be uh, challenging to tease those two apart. But yeah, I, I agree. It, you have to look for other conditions too, especially you know when we see the word idiopathic, right? Idiopathic means that we don't understand why you have this condition, but we you have this condition. And so um, this is where a lot of uh, medical entity entities start is as a syndrome to uh, place a, a, a bins of patients that have similar uh, symptoms and whatnot and study them and try to figure out, you know, um, make that, that pool as homogenous as possible so we can learn from that, that group of patients and then come up with, you know, like narcolepsy type one with uh, hypercretin orexin deficiency, right? A robust biologically confirmed entity. But if we weren't, it, it, it has to start somewhere. But Idiopathic. So just because you, 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 you've been diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia, I wouldn't go through life saying I'm sleepy because I have idiopathic hypersomnia. We just have to remind ourselves that it's idiopathic. We don't have a biologically confirmed um, uh, understanding the pathophysiology underlying idiopathic hypersomnia. So, you know, if you follow those patients for time, maybe they would end up uh, being diagnosed with something else. Just keep that um, in the back of your minds. Um, moving forward. Um, yeah, I don't know if that addressed your question, but you pretty much answered it for, for me. 
Um, yeah, and so then long sleep. So that's it for that. So next thing. So what, what are the symptoms when I'm seeing a patient um, uh, that might have uh, narcolepsy, IH, or just hypersomnolent um, that I look for? So I, I always make sure that I, I, I address all five of these, excessive daytime sleepiness, um, which like we already just talked about, that can be difficult to differentiate sleepiness versus fatigue, kind of a spectrum. Um, cataplexy, and, and really uh, moving towards defining cataplexy as, as typical versus atypical, which we'll probably touch on later. Sleep-related hallucinations, right? Um, hear things, feel things, see things as you fall asleep or wake up. Um, hypnagogic or hypnopompic uh, uh, hallucinations. Sleep paralysis, literally the inability to move even a finger uh, as you fall asleep, as, as someone falls asleep or, or wakes up. Um, you know, this can be often uh, misconstrued as a compression neuropathy where, uh, you know, you're sleeping on your arm and you wake up and your arm, you can't, can't feel it and whatnot. Uh, that's not sleep paralysis. In, in, in my experience, within a few seconds of a, a talking to a patient about sleep paralysis, you can quickly, they usually will offer this up on their own um, that, oh my goodness, yes, I have that. The first time, the first couple of times it, it scared me to, you know, half to death. I, I, I didn't know what was going on. And then you ask about sleep duration and oftentimes they'll say, oh, it, it feels like it lasts forever, but it's probably seconds or they just have a very challenging time um, characterizing the duration. Um, and then disrupted nighttime sleep. There's really no uh, well-defined clinical criteria for this, uh, objective or subjective, but it's just really fragmented sleep. Uh, during the night. So struggling to stay awake during the daytime and maybe struggling, this is exaggerated, but struggling to stay asleep in a consolidated fashion at night. And then some other symptoms when, you, when, when I'm, I'm evaluating for, for this is, of course, sleep inertia, sleep drunkenness. This is this uh, first thing when, when a patient gets up, there's multiple alarm clocks, they have trouble waking up, um, extremely groggy. The somnolence is, is definitely more impactful in the morning hours when they're trying to get up. Um, sleep duration, long sleep, uh, normal sleep, and the restorative nature of naps. Um, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll look at that as well. And so what are our tools? This is probably of, of, of this talk today. Um, I think this is probably one of the more important slides just for um, patient care, advocating for yourself. So just know what's out there what, and, and make sure if, if you're uncertain about your diagnosis, um, make sure that you've kind of at least uh, engaged your, your healthcare providers uh, um, to make sure that one of these tests isn't uh, suitable for your condition or your situation. So a solid history. So I would recommend that a loved one caregiver, uh, especially at that new first consult, always shows up with the, with the patient um, just to establish a rapport with patient family member. It, it, it just, it does so much for the, for the healthcare provider in hearing not only from the patient, but also a loved one, friend, family member. Um, so that's just a tip, I think, that can really help accelerate your care and get things started. Um, there's all kinds of subjective scales. I mean, they're subjective. Um, you know, the classic one that probably every patient uh, on this chat uh, has had is the Epworth sleepiness scale. I don't know how many times I've had an Epworth sleep. The highest number is 24, right? How likely to fall asleep in this situation or that situation? I've had patients, and it goes both ways. They have an Epworth of 20, and I'm like, my goodness, you, you can't stay awake while reading. Uh, it's a three, high chance of falling asleep. Oh, well, no, I don't actually fall asleep. So they're scales. Um, you know, they're not the end all be all, but they're, they can be helpful. But what's, what's a, a high chance of falling asleep for one person might not be at all for the next. And, and so they have their limitations, but, but important. Actigraphy, probably underutilized um, uh, for a variety of reasons we won't delve into, but I think that we need to uh, increase uh, our use in the, in the clinic of actigraphy. Um, actigraphy is nothing more than a, a medical grade, you know, accelerometer uh, placed on the non-dominant hand typically and wearing it for one or two weeks, the longer the better. Um, sleep diary, just, you know, recording your, your sleep habits, what time do you go to sleep, how long does it take you to fall asleep, um, naps, et cetera. And then of course, you know, a, a core uh, part of the diagnostic criteria, the PSG, the overnight sleep study, followed by the MSLT. Um, 
the, the overnight sleep study is really to rule out other conditions, namely sleep apnea, make sure there's a relatively normal sleep architecture, looking very closely to see if uh, there's a, a sleep onset REM period where someone might go into REM sleep very quickly. And then the MSLT, how I describe this to patients and, and other healthcare providers that aren't in sleep is it's, it's all we're doing is a series of five, four to five naps, ideally five, and answering some very simple questions. Do you fall, I'm gonna say you, I apologize for saying you, but uh, I feel like, always feel like I'm talking to a patient. Do you fall asleep on each nap? Uh, eight, 10, 12, two, four. If you do, how long does it take you to fall asleep? And if you do fall asleep, do you go into REM sleep? That's it, we tally that up. That's the, um, how we, we handle MSLT data. We tally that up and, and it, 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 you know, there's diagnostic criteria for narcolepsy and IH. A blood test for LHLA, DQB 10602. So this is not diagnostic. Um, for the sake of this talk, I want you to leave today or, or when you put your head on the pillow, just think that patients with classic type one narcolepsy, just think of them as 100% of them should be HLA or should be, shouldn't. 100% are contradictory, but 100% are HLA positive, narcolepsy type one, because it really simplifies this discussion. So if you're, if you, if someone has a concern for cataplexy, right? So typically cataplexy is going to be type one narcolepsy. And if we were to do a spinal tap, most likely they would be deficient in, in orexin or hypocretin. So if there's ever a concern as to whether this is cataplexy or typical, typical versus atypical cataplexy, which we'll go into a little bit, uh, I'm sure later, um, this is a great place for your uh, healthcare provider and you to uh, advocate. I want to get an HLA test. I want to see what this is. If it's negative, it really um, would side with the fact that if we were to put, uh, uh, do a spinal tap, that the orexin level would come back normal. So in type one narcolepsy, there's a rexin deficiency. If we check a rexin, it's less than 110. And so it's great if there's a, a challenging case trying to differentiate, is this cataplexy, is this not? So if for anyone you know, with a questionable diagnosis of cataplexy, even in your heart of hearts, you're wondering, do I have cataplexy? I have this in this situation, but is it? My healthcare provider isn't sure. An HLA test is a great way to go. And, and then if it's positive, then you might entertain the idea of getting us talking to your healthcare provider about the, the pros and cons of, of, of moving to the next step, which would be an erection test to measure your erection level. This is finally commercially available. Um, and so that's certainly uh, important. Your, your healthcare provider just has to do a little bit of work to get it uh, um, uh, done, but it's, it's, it's commercially available. Dr. Ruoff? Yeah, um, absolutely. Thank you for breaking me up. That's okay. Can you just go back to that slide? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for the HLA marker, yeah. um, isn't it kind of a pretty simple blood test too? Oh my I, gosh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so simple. So any um, sleep doctor should be able to do this, right? Unequivocally, yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. Widely so, available. Um, they just need to make sure that they're doing the right one, that they're not actually doing the one for celiac or it, it, it just it specifically. So uh, at, at my institution, it's, it literally says HLA test for narcolepsy. Um, so yeah, it's, it's widely available. There's, at least in the United States, there, this should be available everywhere. Okay, just as I feel like it is, a, I know it's not diagnostic in, itself, in and of itself, but it's a good clue. And yeah. um, I'm yeah. often surprised how many people haven't, their doctors didn't um, you know, ever look at this. Um, and so I'm glad you have highlighted it here as something that a patient could probably ask their doctor for if they're in this confusing middle yeah, ground, I'm not yeah. sure. And, and it's an important point. So let me, so HLA, so uh, it varies by ethnicity, but if you just go with say maybe 25% of the general population walks around with this uh, HLA positivity. So just because you're positive doesn't mean, doesn't immediately put you into the type one narcolepsy bin, but it doesn't exclude. If you're negative, it really just keeping it very simplistic, you know, algorithm, it really almost excludes uh, orexin deficiency. So it, 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 it immediately kind of makes uh, the narcolepsy type two diagnosis could make it more homogenous, uh, which is the goal um, in that if it's, if you're negative, then you're more certain to be uh, type two. Uh, it does vary by ethnicity. So like African-Americans, they have a high positivity. Japanese ancestry have a low positivity of this. Um, so it can be clinically, it's very helpful when it's, it's negative. 
if it's a if it's a challenging case of atypical cataplexy. And don't forget, you know, there's always um, there can always be some um, psychiatry uh, antidepressants, for example, can can is a, are a great treatment potentially for cataplexy. So you know, it's it's always this uh, debate as to whether oh my goodness, sleepiness started three years ago, patient's been on an antidepressant for ten years. Could this antidepressant be masking the cataplexy? Um, and that's where this might uh, come into play doing the HLA test, but widely available. And if, it, if, you're, if, if you're confused about your diagnosis, your healthcare provider isn't sure, that might be a great place, especially if there's questions of uh, cataplexy, especially. One other question, um, why is the actigraphy helpful? I, I am just not familiar with why that would be a helpful tool. Yeah, yeah, great question, but I know you are um, familiar. Uh, but so, uh, so one, so going back to the, you know, the differential up here, right? So we want to look at insufficient sleep. We want to look for long sleep, uh, potentially. So it, it immediately will give us an objective assessment of that. Um, it also will look at, uh, is the patient uh, not getting enough sleep th during the week and then playing catch up on the weekend? Um, but we'll talk about it in a, in a couple slides here. Um, if the MSLT is negative and one of the, the, the core complaints of the patient is sleepiness and long sleep, they have to, they're sleeping long hours, then actigraphy is a way that you can actually sense according to ICSD3, a diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia. So someone could have a negative MSLT, their MSLT does not suggest a CNS hypersomnia, like narcolepsy, idiopathic hypersomnia, but uh, while wearing one of these for two weeks, or, or coming in for a, um, a, um, an ad lib, an, a 24 hour, 48 hour sleep study, which is near impossible in the United States unless it's research, um, you document that they're sleeping you know, 600, 660 minutes on average uh, each night, which is a lot. So that's what 10, 11 hours of, of sleep a night on average. Um, but that's where it can be very helpful and it can actually uh, lead to a, a you know a, a, an ICSD3 diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia, okay. um, but it's also used great you know for ruling out things too, right? Is the patient just not getting insufficient sleep? Are they all over the map, going to bed late one night, early the next? They they have this self-inflicted uh, uh, perpetual jet lag, you know? They don't know if they're coming or going, so it can be very helpful. Um, so so diagnostic criteria. So I, I am going to belabor this point. Usually I fly through this, but so for type one narcolepsy, what, what do we need here? So we need sleepiness for at least three, nap, uh, three months and the presence of one or both of the following. So cataplexy and a positive MSLT. So I inevitably will say positive MSLT. So what does that mean? That means on those five naps, on average, uh, the patient falls asleep in less than eight minutes, less than equal to eight minutes. And on two of the naps, they immediately go into uh, a REM sleep within 15 minutes. And so we term that a SOREM, a sleep onset REM period. So less than equal to eight minutes, average sleep latency of falling asleep, and then going into two or more uh, uh, REMs on the naps. Um, that, and also on the overnight test, if they slip into dream sleep within 15 minutes, that can count towards this. Um, this number, you know, this eight minutes used to be five minutes. I won't go back too far as uh, historically all the changes, but it used to be uh, five minutes, but it was increased to eight minutes to increase the sensitivity and it maintained about the same level of specificity. Um, or uh, a, a, a lumbar puncture to check for a, a Rexin or hypocretin. Sorry, we love, in, med in the medical community, we like to have at least two names for everything. So hypocretin or Rexin. And so that can be diagnosis, diagnostic for type one narcolepsy as well, without cataplexy. Uh, you don't have, because it's one or both. So someone could not have cataplexy but have orexin deficiency and be diagnosed with type one narcolepsy. Narcolepsy type two. So same thing, first thing, at least three months of uh, sleepiness, a positive MSLT. The overnight study, uh, it's always important to have an overnight study followed by a daytime uh, MSLT. Um, that is the standard. So anyone out there that had them separate, uh, that's a problem. Um, and uh, cataplexy, no uh, cataplexy is not present. And if a hypercretin lumbar puncture was done to check orexin levels, um, it's normal or in, uh, more than 110. And here it's just that the, the, the sleepiness complaint is not better explained by something else. This, this is what Julie uh, talked about. Is there another condition? Are there any, alert, are there any findings on the neurologic exam? 
um, any medical disorder, medications, psychiatric illnesses that might be contributing. Um, is there a circadian rhythm? Is there a delayed sleep phase? Going to bed very, very late and then waking up you know, later in the day, but yet societal pressures force those uh, folks or us to you know, wake up early. That's the, that's the, the goal here um, uh, in society, it seems. So looking for other possible explanations. Um, idiopathic hypersomnia. So again, um, sleepiness um, for three months, no cataplexy. This is the difference right here. So right now in the current diagnostic criteria, idiopathic hypersomnia versus narcolepsy is simply differentiated by number of SOROMs, a sleep onset REM period. So both narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia have to, on the MSLT, have to fall asleep on average in less than equal to eight minutes. Um, but with IH, there's not a REM uh, propensity. Um, so they have less out of all those five naps, um, there's less than two. So there can be one sleep onset REM period, but they can't have two. If they have two, then that would put them in a narcolepsy bin. So this is the really the differentiating factor between narcolepsy type two and IH here. And the presence of at least one of the following, um, this is what this is to your question, Julie. The actigraphy. So actigraphy, if if the actigraphy watch, the glorified medical grade accelerometer, demonstrates more than 666 minutes, uh, or you're fortunate enough to get a 24 hour overnight or 24 hour PSG polysomnogram, if you can sense this 660, this is according to ICSD3 can is supports a diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, hence my point that I don't think that we're doing actigraphy enough. Um, and then again, uh, kind of the last number similar to the narcolepsy is looking for other, other potential causes um, uh, that might better explain the sleepiness. All right, so, so what are we left with? So we're left with kind of two things. We're left with narcolepsy, which we now differentiate between narcolepsy type one that typically can have cataplexy, but it doesn't have to have cataplexy. Um, and if a spinal tap is done, they, they, if they're orexin deficient, hypercretin deficient. And then idiopathic hypersomnia. So I just went through here and just kind of um, put some uh, descriptors here of how you kind of differentiate or how I differentiate in the clinic. So sleepiness um, with narcolepsy and sleepiness, brain fog. Brain fog comes up more in the idiopathic hypersomnia literature, um, but certainly this is not absolute, um, just kind of a, a clinical phenotype. Um, I'm just trying to paint here. With cataplexy, so we're trying to get in, I uh, missed an L here, but typical versus atypical cataplexy versus no cataplexy, right? So ideally with no cataplexy, that's more of a narcolepsy type two. And IH, of course, no cataplexy. The restorative nature of sleep and naps, more so with narcolepsy phenotype, less so with IH, right? So non-restorative long periods of sleep, uh, naps are less refreshing, which in some instances, when you, when you get this history, it's like, why did you take the nap to begin with? because they almost wake up worse off than before they uh, took a nap. Um, and it sometimes can last hours with IH, um, typically. Um, again, wake up feeling refreshed. The sleep inertia, sleep and drunkenness uh, in the IH phenotype, uh, that's, a, that's certainly a big one, um, a clue. Um, more of the REM-related phenomenon, the hallucinations we talked of, the paralysis, disrupted nighttime sleep, that fits more of a narcolepsy phenotype. And then IH more classically, there's no REM-related phenomena, but REM-related phenomena can occur in the general population. So just because someone has sleep paralysis does not mean, oh my goodness, they have narcolepsy. That's an important point. Um, and depending upon the, the study you quote, maybe five, 10 plus percent of the general population have experienced sleep paralysis and even higher with the hallucinations. So just because someone has sleep paralysis hallucinations and they're not sleepy does not mean, oh my goodness, I need to go see a sleep doctor to be evaluated for narcolepsy. Um, but if they have those and they're sleepy, uh, then you might have something there. Um, comorbid sleep disorders. So in the narcolepsy phenotype, um, more REM behavior disorder, acting out their dreams, leg twitches, sleep apnea. In the IH, really kind of the, the, the cardinal rule is to rule out other sleep disorders. Because we don't understand the underlying pathophysiology, it's, it's difficult, at least for me, to say that there's, oh, in IH, there's this comorbid condition. Similar to the narcolepsy type two, until we understand the under, you know, the pathophysiologic underpinnings, um, it's difficult to say, oh, there's comorbid conditions. 
Um, but in NT1, there's been plenty of comorbidities described uh, and, and replicated obesity, eat, nocturnal eating, precocious puberty, psychiatric illnesses. Um, and with IH, you just want to be in narcolepsy type 2, you just want to make sure that, or I question that the comorbidities, they might be actually contributing to the clinical picture. Um, so psychiatric overtones and, and IH and, and, and uh, narcolepsy type 2. Autonomic symptoms uh, in the IH uh, phenotype. For some reason, a lot of the patients that I see have some autonomic uh, uh, symptoms um, and ultimately go on to be diagnosed with IH. So kind of putting these into bins. Uh, certainly, I feel like there is a clinical phenotype when I'm seeing uh, evaluating patients for hypersomnia. But then ultimately, we're left with the MSLT to uh, differentiate these two. Um, another important point, and I've highlighted already, in, narcolepsy, in patients with narcolepsy without cataplexy, so this is type 2 narcolepsy, if, if they undergo a spinal tap, if you had the, the HLA, so you had a question of, do I have type 1 or whatnot, or do I have atypical cataplexy, and you got the HLA test, um, your healthcare provider ordered it for you, and it were positive, in some, in some publications, if you did a spinal tap, even though you don't have cataplexy, 15 to 20% of those patients uh, uh, have a chance of uh, being found to be orexin deficient. What does that do? Well, that then changes your diagnosis to narcolepsy type one. Um, and I, I think this is a, an important point to mention as well. So in, in, in this study um, by Andlar et al, African-Americans were found, were 4.5 fold more likely to be found to have orexin deficiency without cataplexy compared to Caucasians. So clinically, um, if, I, if I'm evaluating a patient with a CNS hypersomnia and they're African-American, I'm paying very close attention to the presence or absence or atypical cataplexy and really thinking about this um, after the MSLT is performed um, that maybe we should be doing HLA and, and, and at least talking about uh, orexin testing. My goal as a clinician is to try to pull out as much, um, yeah, just to, 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 to if, if we have a chance to do HLA and, and find orexin deficiency, we should be doing that um, to better define uh, these conditions uh, for patients, family members, and for prognosis. So what are some of the MSLT challenges, the, the, over, the daytime study? So this, these are the challenges. So the MSLT is positive for narcolepsy in, in the general population in six out of 100 men and one out of 100 women. That's a problem. So you run the test on a, a random sample of the general population in 100 patients, six men and, 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 and one woman are going to be positive uh, for narcolepsy, regardless of symptoms. And this is the general population? General population. This is not people presenting for uh, daytime sleepiness. They would, they would go and remind us that would be falling asleep within eight minutes. Less than equal to eight minutes and having at least two dream periods. Wow. So this gets to false positives, right? So if someone comes in complaining about fatigue and their GP sends them to a sleep doctor and they just are doing MSLTs a lot, there is a true risk based on this general population data to have false positives, um, false positive diagnosis. Um, maybe this isn't narcolepsy. So to your point, Julie, it's always, you know, making sure that you're, you, if there are other symptoms, you know, delve into those other symptoms and make sure that there's not another explanation out there, um, like you alluded to lupus or something like that. Um, and in the general population, the MSLT, so falling asleep less than eight minutes, that was positive in these studies in about 22% of the uh, general population. That's high. Remember, that's the diagnostic criteria for idiopathic hypersomnia, less than equal to eight minutes. And so that's, you know, if we just general population had a hundred patients come in from the general population, that the 23% of them would meet this criteria. Shift workers. So, and I use define, use shift workers loosely. So if someone is having this social jet lag of being insufficient with their sleep during the week and then catching up on the weekend, that's essentially kind of a, a social jet lag is a, is a kind of a form of, well, at least a circadian, you know, uh, um, irregularity. And so that increases the likelihood potentially of a, of a positive MSLT 30 times more likely, likely with shift workers to have a positive MSLT. Antidepressant use, um, 11 times more likely to have a positive MSLT, positive meaning for narcolepsy. 
And getting speaking to the IH uh, community in this study, and they, they really uh, leverage the power of doing uh, uh, ad lib uh, overnight sleep testing, you know, 24, uh, I think 24, 48 hours. 44% and 39%, two different studies here, of patients with IH had a mean sleep latency of greater than equal to eight minutes. And so with additional tests, a 24 hour sleep study, they were able to uh, uh, demonstrate a, a diagnosis of IH. But if that clinician, if their healthcare providers had only done the uh, PS, the overnight test and the MSLT, they would have been missed. And so this is where in the US, we don't have the luxury of, of 24 hour sleep tests and stuff yet, or, or maybe we don't have it, I guess. Um, actigraphy you know, uh, can be helpful. Um, and in 71% of the IH folks with long sleep, 71% had a mean sleep latency of greater than equal to eight minutes. So on one hand, you have in the general population, 22% meeting this criteria, but in these folks, they're not, they're not um, uh, uh, meeting this criteria. And so then over the last, you know, five years or so, then another thing that's been called into question is the repeatability. How, how robust is this MSLT? So that if you do it today and then you do it two years, three years from now, does it end up with the same uh, result? And so here's a slide that really, there are which, a couple other studies here, go ahead. Which was why I meant to say this in the beginning, you know, your paper and your work in this area is, you know, why we really wanted to have you as part of this discussion because of this research you did. And yeah. I think it's really helpful for people to understand because they're often like, how could my diagnosis change? And, yeah. um, and thinking yeah. it's just them and guys, it's not just you <laughs> if your diagnosis yeah. is changing. Um, so anyway, go ahead. But yeah. I meant to say and that in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so probably I should have probably presented this other information after this as a potential explanation as to why this is, is it's occurring or why we, why we found this. So three different studies. So it's been replicated. Now, all these studies um, are retrospective. That is a huge limitation. Um, so this isn't something prospective that I see a patient, we do an overnight test in MSLT, and then uh, prescriptively, we do an, a repeat MSLT uh, six months, a year later, and see is the, is the repeatability of that stable across time. So a big question and limitation is why was the study repeated in, this, in, the, in these data? But um, what we found across three different studies is that the MSLT in, in type one narcolepsy with cataplexy um, or hypocretin or exin deficiency or typical cataplexy in HLA positive, that blood test positive, it's pretty uh, 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 test retest, the repeatability of it, 91%. Uh, of folks that have a positive MSLT on the first and the first a positive test on the first MSLT, they'll go on to have a, uh, another one that's positive. That's what you want to see, right? So when you when you uh, talk to loved ones and stuff about your condition, you want to say, yeah, I had an MSLT and it showed this, and it's it's a it's a re repeatable, reliable test. And if I did it in six months, it'd be positive again. That's what you want to see. And uh, in this other uh, uh, group, it was 81% likely to be repeat. If you did a repeat, it would be positive again. Whereas you can see in narcolepsy type two and IH, it's not a stable phenotype. Um, if, a narco, if a patient is rendered a diagnosis of narcolepsy type two, they meet the MSLT criteria, they don't have cataplexy. If they have the spinal tap and their orexin or hypercretin is normal, if you repeat that test, that MSLT, it could change. Um, it could go negative. It can switch to idiopathic hypersomnia and, and, and vice versa. Same thing goes with idiopathic hypersomnia. So uh, a patient has a daytime test, they're falling asleep less than equal to eight minutes, six months, a year, two years, three years later, they repeat it, um, it'll be negative. And so this is extremely frustrating, not only for patients, but healthcare providers. And this is the biggest challenge that we face in evaluating CNS hypersomnias. The MSLT is our best objective test to measure sleepability, the, you know, the, the, the likelihood of someone's told to fall asleep to, to try to fall asleep. But there's huge limitations, uh, at least in, in type 2 narcolepsy and IH. And so while I believe just clinically, my, my, my view is that there's a clinical phenotype, I think, with narcolepsy type 2 versus IH, certainly with IH with long sleep. The MSLT, I don't know if that's really the test in the future that we should be use, using to differentiate these conditions as we're doing today. Um, 
Dr. Roth, can you just take a second? So absolutely. So these different colors. So these are not the sleep studies. These are the different studies just, yeah. that have looked at this topic. Um, so your study was the blue one, the one that yep. you did. Yes. So, um, so you found that when people had a type one narcolepsy diagnosis, and then it got repeated at like, MSLT, they did another one later, which, oh, no fun. Um, but okay. So yeah. you had to do it again yeah. and it's 99 per 91% of the time had the same result. Same result. Yep. Okay. Same result. And then for, nar for people with narcolepsy type one, they got that original diagnosis. Um, and then you found that that the second time you did it only 36% of the people Correct. would get the same diagnosis. Same diagnosis. Yeah. What else would happen then that they would go into the IH bucket IH category, or they would be negative, um, which is a challenge. So now why would we, in a narcolepsy type two, historically, why would we, if the first MSLT was negative, what would be the incentive in repeating it? Well, uh, trying to get a, um, a diagnosis of narcolepsy, right? That's one of the main reasons uh, for coverage for medications that Historically, clinically, you know, uh, we might repeat an MSLT, but even if it's positive at first and you and you repeat it, it might go negative. So it could be negative at first, positive second uh, for narcolepsy type two, or you know, vice versa. So it's and it might go negative. It might turn to idiopathic hypersomnia. So it's all over the map. Um, so what to do? Uh, you know, if you have an MSLT. And you know your loved ones around you, and everyone you know they they strongly uh, suspect the CNS hypersomnia. There's sleepiness. You see it with your own eyes, family members. Um, the question is to repeat the test um, or not. Um, certainly for clinical care and getting access to things, it can be very helpful. If the MSLT wasn't um, what was expected, uh, it was negative. It was positive for IH. Um, so this is a clinical matter, but from a research perspective or, or just a diagnostic uh, um, uh, issue, this is troubling. Um, the MSLT does not, is not a, a reliable test according to these three different studies here. So these are three different, you know, research groups um, with different patients um, that, that came to it's very similar uh, conclusions here. Um, so that's the challenge. So, so the real question is, you know, where do we go from here? So the most, most robust, like robust objective test we have is not repeatable, at least yeah. in this, this data here. And I feel like it's just not fair to patients to have to feel like you're going into an MSLT and just hoping that your brain goes into the right, you know, forms and um, because everyone's experience is very real, you know, and, yeah, um, absolutely. their symptoms are real. Like you said, family members, people like it's, it's real. Um, and so this is kind of feels like you're, um, throwing a dart at a dartboard to see if, uh, you could get an MSLT, um, result that's going to be helpful for medication and coverage. Yeah. And so now some other explanations, right? So we talked about shift work that, 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 you know, as a high likelihood of, a of, of, a of a positive MSLT, right? 30 fold increased risk. So that's why, you know, that, that we recently came out with new guidelines for the MSLT. And it's just so important that healthcare providers, but also patients kind of advocate and um, project sleep and everything that we're doing the overnight test and the MSLT to a T. Um, so we're getting the actigraphy for two weeks, you know, you're bringing family members, caregiver, family member, caregiver, friend, whatever loved ones to those appointments to establish that patient doctor relationship, that rapport, Day, you know, visit one. It's so critical because of these issues. Um, you know, some, some might argue uh, that we should be really diagnosing this based on symptoms, um, symptomatology, which is, is challenging um, because we, we really like to have an objective test to say, aha, this test is positive. Um, but that's out there that we should rely more upon symptoms, which having caregivers and patients and uh, family members and friends there is, is a very important in that situation. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we go to that, but um, just emphasizing, yeah, it's challenging. Um, go ahead. No, I think that's, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my last side is, is where do we go from here? Right. Um, and I don't have the answer. Uh, I, so I, what I didn't show here is, so historically, right? So in like 2000, 
That's when it was discovered that narcolepsy in humans was due to narcolepsy type one with cataplexy was due to uh, orexin deficiency, hypercretin deficiency. So before then, you know, we had HLA, some of these uh, uh, HLA uh, findings that in narcolepsy with cataplexy, they were more positive for HLA markers. Um, but it wasn't until 2000 where we were able to take these patients and say, look, aha, we have a biologically confirmed entity here. So now we can define this group as, as, as a homogenous group. Um, so we pull those out. And my feeling is, and, and this can be debated back and forth, but that really the next step is to what to do with this, these, these patients that have an MSLT that on one time it shows narcolepsy type two and the next time it shows IH and vice versa. Um, what do we do with those patients? I think the first thing is that we pull, what, what else can we pull out? So I highlighted, so African-Americans, um, narcolepsy type two, uh, more likely not to have cataplexy and yet have orexin deficiency. Take those out of there, right? So be more, when you're, when you're evaluating patients or you're advocating for a loved one, keep that in mind. Um, and then long sleep. So there's been some of these really nice cluster analysis looking at you know, symptomatology and clustering them. And it does appear that idiopathic hypersomnia with long sleep, uh, my belief based on the data is that that's a pretty homogenous group. So I think that intuitively that's the next step is to, to take those patients and kind of put them in their own diagnostic entity, which is why I think that we're not doing enough actigraphy, not doing enough uh, prolonged PSG overnight sleep testing to, to um, define that group of patients, capture that group of patients. And then what we're left with is this potentially is in my study, I think maybe 30% of the type two narcolepsies, narcolepsy patients repeat, repeated both times positive. So maybe perhaps I'm not suggesting that we do two MSLTs to define this, this strong, repeatable, reliable phenotype, but maybe that is a, a reliable phenotype where if you have patients with two positive MSLTs for narcolepsy, maybe that's, that's a, a phenotype that we can study and learn from. So, you know, there's been other studies looking at, at these conditions using uh, or, uh, uh, tools like imaging. And a lot of the imaging findings in, in CNS hypersomnias are, are not consistent. And it's probably because we're not phenotyping these patients into homogenous groups. So until we can do that, um, we really can't advance the field, I feel like. Um. Yeah, I mean, there's a few proposals out right now about yeah. what to, where to go from here, um, and um, we'll make sure that those are in our toolkit. And um, you know, the, for our nerds that love reading papers, um, they're interesting, uh, and and I think we will see some change uh, when they do the next uh, ICD, whatever international classification. Oh, um, yeah, because it just doesn't seem right that people should feel like, you know, you get attached to a disease name, you know, like, okay, I figured it out. Um, and these are already very stigmatized conditions. And then to have your like disease name change, um, it is a big change in people's sense of identity, even though I think from a research side, we say, you're still part of our club. Don't worry. You know, um, you're part of our community. Your symptoms are real. Um, you're having a real experience. Um, and Absolutely. you know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be able to switch that easily. I think on people, um, just from a personal perspective. Um, I did have one question to you because you did mention atypical cataplexy and I'm not so yeah. familiar with the use of that term. So, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, the clinically, you know, I, when I, when I'm asking this question, um, you know, does anything unusual happen with laughter, um, saying something funny, uh, coming up with a witty joke? Um, that's usually how I ask it to a patient. And typically, a patient that doesn't have a CNS hypersomnia, doesn't have, you know, cataplexy, they look at me dumbfounded, like, what in the world? Does anything happen? And typically the jokester says, oh, no one laughs. I'm telling a joke, no one laughs. That's what happens. I'm like, ha, ha, ha. Um, but the other thing that happens often is like, well, what do you mean? I mean, I laugh, um, you know, so then, so leading them, not leading them, you know, asking in a very unbiased uh, uh, basis is really important, but typically, after they're kind of looking at me like puzzled, like this guy's weird, um, some weird questions there. Um, I'm like, such as jaw sagging, knees buckling, falling to the ground, those kinds of things. And, you know, in the, in the general clinic, you know, 99.99% say, oh no, no, I don't do that. 
occasionally you might get someone that says, well, yeah, when I laugh really hard or something like that, something might happen. Um, like a lot, the, the classic kind of cliche thing of, I laughed so hard I fell to the ground, right? Um, so that's a positive emotion, laughter, right? So there's negative emotions too, right? Anger, startled, scared. These are all negative emotions. So typical cataplexy is typically triggered by um, typical. How many times can I say typical in one sentence? Um, by a positive emotion. So classically, laughter. That 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 uh, is the right trigger. The duration is another thing, right? So duration. The typical duration is pretty short. Um, and I, I'm not the one that should be talking to that. I mean, that's the, that's the patients that should be talking to you about that. But, you know, it's atypical for cataplexy to go on for prolonged periods of times, um, you know, hours. It, it, uh, if, it, if that's there, then we like to hear that, oh, there's also, you know, shorter, short, the typical is a, a short attack. Um, it's not typical to always fall to the ground, not to have any warning, uh, have an injury. So that would be atypical. It can happen, but it's not typical. And there should also be these more typical episodes triggered by a positive emotion. So the classic thing, short duration, triggered by a positive emotion, typically, you know, affecting the neck, the shoulders, the, the head bobbing, maybe a little bit of knee buckling. Um, and it's not so rapid that there's not a, a time to, to prevent injury. It, it, it's almost, I always kind of equate it to like an accordion uh, 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 collapse. And so, that's typical versus atypical. So atypical would be a negative emotion only, um, long duration, um, those kinds of things. Whereas a typical would be a positive emotion, you know, 10 seconds, short duration, yeah. um, those sort of things. I feel like um, uh, I hear from a lot of people, very subtle, even more subtle than the jaw dropping. Um, people saying like, a pop, like having to sort of pause you know, and this is true to my experience living with severe cataplexy is that when I'm on medication, you know, kind of, those are kind of your internal coping is like, oh, I kind of just kind of like pause myself to not make it worse sort of, or um, someone saying they lose, someone had described that they lose their smile when they, when they're, mm -hmm. um, you know, they say, oh, you, you lose your smile when you laugh. And that's because she's having a hard time with their job, but not necessarily like dropping open. Yeah. You know, um, so it is really interesting to think about, I, I like how you present more from the idea of like, what happens when you laugh, as opposed to going from the perspective, like, are you falling down? Um, because I think there's a lot of subtlety in many Absolutely. people that have mild yeah. cataplexy. Yeah. Um, I'd yeah. argue <laughs> personally that the idea of, of positive emotions being typical, um, is a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, I mean, um, I think that is because it's unique. Whereas, um, and I've talked to Dr. Scammell about this, negative emotions could cause, um, you know, some sort of like fainting other things. Right. Uh, and so the positive emotions are more um, unique to cataplexy, but I don't think that that necessarily means that they're um, entirely more typical. I know annoyance and uh, were very early ones for me. So, yeah, yeah. I think it's just the, the if there are negative, it's, it's, it's a more of a typical case if there's also positive, if there's yeah. only negative and that's it, um, that, that would be classified as atypical. Now, regardless if that's typical or atypical, if it's, as, as we know it now, it's kind of on the atypical and that's where the HLA testing that we talked about earlier can come into play. The erection testing, especially if, if you and your heart as a patient say, I, I, this is cataplexy, then engage, advocate for yourself and, and, and go down this path of HLA, especially if your MSLT is negative, my goodness gracious. Yeah. So, Well, Lauren, do we have any questions from the yeah. audience? We have lots of great questions and we have people tuning in from Canada, Europe, the US and Mexico. So uh -huh. that's really exciting to see. Um, so there's a couple of questions about like, like diagnosis and differentiation. Um, so one is that, uh, you know, you mentioned medical grade devices for actigraphy. Um, mm -hmm. And then somebody's wondering about um, like more commercial type devices, like a Fitbit or Apple Watch, if those have any kind of usefulness in this. Uh, that's going to be dependent upon your healthcare provider. Um, you know, that's going to vary widely from, from provider to provider. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's data. Uh, present it, you know, present it to the, the clinician uh, when, you, when you're working with them initially. Um, yeah, 
Uh, well, I would think that, you know, I often am a kind of a roll my eyes at the technology, but if you're looking at when someone falls asleep and wakes up, isn't that sort of what those things can do the best as opposed to what stages of sleep you're going into? Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So when I look at that data, so I'll elaborate on that, you know, I'm looking at, okay, what's the time in bed? Cause typically, you know, that's, you know, going to show, uh, you will see that abruptly, right. With, and, and most of these devices are pretty good at that. And what time are they getting up? Um, so that, that serves as the bookend. So looking at that, and then, um, and then going so it's from more there, like right? actually uh, probably like time in bed versus time asleep is yeah. Yeah. So that's the first thing I kind of try to look at it, depending upon the device and how the data they present the data so differently, uh, from device device, but, uh, certainly looking at that can be very helpful. Um, and as a, as a clinician looking at that to see, are they having that social jet lag phenomenon of not a lot of sleep during the week and then catching up on the weekends. And that can lead to a great conversation. Um, it, it, so it can be useful. Um, but as far as a diagnosis, um, currently the, the academy uh, is not, you know, it needs more rigorous testing and FDA clearance and approval and, and everything. So it has to be a, a, a designate, you know, a, a recognized uh, medical grade device. And then um, an, another person asked um, in repeating the MSLT from like a pro pragmatic perspective, is there much incentive to repeat a positive MSLT for narcolepsy type one? Like if you're changing healthcare providers or. No, I think you could just get yourself into trouble. So this is a, a robust case. Your prior healthcare provider, the prior healthcare provider uh, felt this was narcolepsy type one, um, a new healthcare provider. I don't know why you would do that. Um, that could just get that patient into trouble from a from a management perspective. I, I don't know the utility of that. Um, the only um, way that would ever come up is if the new healthcare provider, you know, they, they they didn't believe the data or something, or they saw inconsistency. The patient was on antidepressants um, during the first one. Um, but if it's a robust case of cataplexy, I mean, why do that? Uh, Um, and then we have some, some other questions. Um, so uh, Jackie's asking, there's a pattern often seen in long COVID, which is the development of insomnia in the early months, the transitions to disabling idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, have you been seeing this? And do you have ideas about research that might be done related to this? I, I mean, I, I've seen it. Um, I've also seen it um, get better. Um, you know, anecdotally, I have not seen a lot of patients with this. I'm not um, doing any research in this area. I know there's a lot of call for grants for, for long COVID and, and, and hypersomnia. Um, so I, I'm not specifically aware of any one uh, uh, university academician uh, looking into this, but I'm sure it's being done. Clinical dri clinicaltrials.org, that's a great place to start for looking up any trial. So that person that asked that question, go on clinical trials type in your question, COVID, hypersomnia, whatever, and see if there's any studies out there. Long COVID, MSLT, there's a search bar that you can do to figure out what's going on in the, in the world. Um, all clinical trials uh, that meet certain criteria are required to register on clinical trials. It's a great resource. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, so the experience still after two years is that it, I mean, um, that often those are resolving after some point. That's what I've seen. I, I've definitely seen some uh, some pretty troubling cases and that that get better. Um, yeah, I think there's still a lot to be learned. Um, yeah, and uh, glad to see that there continues to seem to be literature to show that um, there is some neurological stuff that is happening um, post COVID, but not narcolepsy. Uh, looked, I think right. the latest I, I saw was that. maybe an increase in Parkinson's and MS. Um, but not, uh, not narcolepsy, not yeah. narcolepsy. So that's good. I mean, none right. of it's good, but <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Nothing. So COVID is, doesn't appear to be like H1N1, right? Both the infection in China that showed an increased incidence. And then also the vaccine in Europe, at least the pandemics vaccine that, that showed an increase uh, in incidence. Um, but we haven't seen that with COVID that I'm aware of. Yeah. And then I, I know you can't give medical advice, um, Dr. Ralph, but there's well, a, a question about um, do, 
Can you speak to treatments that are recommended for people with IH and also an autonomic uh, uh, dysfunction? That's tough uh, in this forum. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a that's a tough one. But I, I and so I can only say you know there's only one FDA approved medication currently for IH, and uh, that's a, a Zywave low sodium oxybate. That's the only FDA approved. Go to clinicaltrials.org. Um, and you can find uh, uh, quite a few trials that are listed there for idiopathic hypersomnia that either have just started or they're going to be starting soon. And so that's a great resource, especially if you're, if you're not inclined to do something like Oxibate, go find some of these clinical trials that are ongoing. And if that speaks to you, um, it certainly helps the community, um, you know, see if there's a, a, a site in, in your neck of the woods and, and reach out to them and, and see. Um, there are some non-FDA approved medications um, for IH, but I don't think this is the proper place to go. And it's definitely, definitely a different topic. Yeah, um, I think that's a really good point about the clinical trials, though. Right now, there are, um, you know, a good amount, I'd say, for narcolepsy and IH, and there will continue to be. Um, and also one of the benefits of those trials is often you really do get good medical care. And, um, I imagine like if, I don't know if you'd be excluded, if you weren't sure of your diagnosis, but you might learn more about your condition. I've heard people say they learn more about their condition by being part of a rigorous trial. Yeah. Hopefully that that's a great point. So using, maybe you're not interested in those clinical trials, but that might be an interesting way, um, for the community to, if they're, you're having, finding, having trouble finding a, a doctor and, in your area that, 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 that listens to you, understands you, uh, is, is knowledgeable in, in CNS hypersomnias, go there and just see it, what sites are listed. Um, that's, that's an interesting way. And hopefully the clinician there is, has a, a sincere interest um, in CNS hypersomnias. Yeah, that's but awesome. also participating in the trial, you could possibly Absolutely. end up having more sleep studies, getting more familiar with Absolutely. what is happening for you. Absolutely. And then a lot of these trials, you know, sometimes they'll have HLA testing that's provided for free. Uh, oftentimes there might be an optional, uh, even a Rexin test. Um, and then if you need to, they, they, yeah, they could repeat the testing, pros and cons to that, but that sometimes is available within uh, the trials as well. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a, a really... Important point, clinicaltrials.org, yeah. I think. Yeah. I had one more question that I thought of too, is that um, you've talked a lot about the spinal tab or, you know, the hypocretin. Yes. Well, there's a real word for it. What did you call it? The... Orexin or hypocretin. Uh, uh, spinal... well, well, the spinal tab thing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, it's yeah. used more in Europe now than the U.S. It's not obviously a comfortable procedure uh, to have done. So... Uh, do you think there's any hope for some other ways of measuring uh, hypocretin or yeah, is it would this be kind great. of a it would really, and... It would revolutionize uh, evaluation and diagnosis if we had a blood test, but that's an important point. The HLA is not diagnostic, right, that we talked about. There's not really a blood test that diagnoses narcolepsy or, or IH yet. Um, so uh, I'm not aware of, you know, any, any uh, developments in, in this space. Uh, there's nothing coming to us, you know, uh, in the near future. That's for sure. Right. So, do you uh, that think that, the, that we will like that? There's going to be increased use of that spinal tab in the U.S. So, it's been part of our diagnostic criteria since 2014, right? So, 2000 ish. This is you know uh, uh, the how his you know uh, research unfolds. So, 2000 we see we find uh, erection deficiency in, in in humans for narcolepsy, right? 2014, it finally makes it into the diagnostic criteria. 2019, at least in the United States, um, it's now commercially available. Um, that's great that it's now commercially available, but it took us 19 years to get it to where it's not just research, it's commercially available. And is um, it reimbursed by insurance, I guess? I can only speak to the patients that I, I and pro providers I talk to, yes, um, it is. Interesting. There could be an N01 out there for that person. I apologize, <laughs> but I haven't heard any, uh, yeah, negative outcomes there as far okay. as coverage. Lauren, do we have more questions? Um, there is one, uh, one question um, from Taylor. Uh, so 
curious about how somebody can have um, a cataplexy episode, but kind of be able to fight it or hide it when they're feeling that muscle weakness. Yeah, Julie. Well, I think that's you're, you're very better much... suited than that. You <laughs> need to answer that. Yeah, I think it's part of the experience, uh, and I think it's a little bit probably under recognized by clinicians um, that as you're experiencing this, it you know especially if you had a slow onset of cataplexy, you know, you might learn how to kind of like mask it or stop your emotion um, <laughs> pretty well. Um, so I think that's why when Dr. Ruoff talked about taking the perspective of like what happens when you laugh allows for that pause of, you know, well, something weird, you know, um, <laughs> as opposed to thinking, oh no, I'm not falling down. So I couldn't have cataplexy. Um, and I think talking about partial cataplexy and, some of those, um, you know, more subtle aspects of it are, are really important and, and something that we need to continue to talk about as the patient community to make sure that clinicians understand also the range of emotions uh, that cause it and, um, and how it can manifest. So, yeah. Yeah, I didn't expect to talk about this, but it, you, you just jogged my memory and just clinical care. So, you know, you're talking to, I'm talking to a patient uh, and trying to, to, for me to decide just, you know, is this cataplexy that they're describing or not? And, and the patient will go on and on and kind of give descriptions. And then at some point I'm like, well, can I, can I, if, if you had an episode, right? Have, first of all, have you had an episode where we've been in this encounter? Usually that's a no, but and I don't typically ask that, but that is, a, is certainly a question. But if you had one, would I be able to see it? Um, I sometimes will ask patients that. And if they say, uh, yeah. Uh, and then I'll say, well, what's it look like? So, you know, sometimes an action and acting, you know, uh, tapping into your inner acting skills, at least to the patient, can be very helpful um, mm -hmm. rather than using words to describe, oh, this happens or that. Just, just what does it look like? Show the clinician. That's uh, a great idea. And have a loved one, family member, friend with you. Uh, that will help you all so much. Yeah, I think that's that's a great idea. And also, I know for me, um, it, it was a loved one. A loved one could hear cataplexy in my voice without me even realizing I was having it, that my words started to slur um, yeah. and say, sit down, sit down. And I'm like, what? Oh, ah, you know, I don't want to, I want to say what I want to say, which is funny, but um, that they could hear it in my voice, which is, you know, um, understanding the subtleties of it, I guess as well. But that was their outside yeah. experience, not mine. Well, um, we're over time, so maybe we should go ahead and, and, and thank you so much, Dr. Ruoff, for coming in and tackling this challenging topic. Um, I know it's a lot, and um, you know, thank you everyone for tuning in today and joining us. We will be developing our usual toolkit. Um, let me just go ahead and really quickly uh, pull up the end of our slides here. Um, let's see, oops, you're probably not seeing that because I didn't share my screen. Too many things. Here we go. Um, so really quick, just want to, of course, mention the patient organizations because they are incredible and they're important and they have so many different great resources. So um, especially when you're um, thinking about hypersomnia, check out the Hypersomnia Foundation has so many incredible online resources. Narcolepsy Network um, will have a great, they'll have their annual conference back in person this year. Um, I think it's going to be in Atlanta, of course, us and Wake Up Narcolepsy has a lot going on um, all throughout the year. So check these out. International ones are online. And just quickly, just to remind you guys that we will have our next broadcast on narcolepsy at work, talking about work and work accommodations, and that will be on August 31st. And as well, please join us in Nashville for our first in-person event in three years. Um, it'll be on August 13th, and we have a great lineup of, of clinician and patient speakers, so um, really looking forward to that as well. You can register on our website, um, and yeah, just thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Ruoff. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you so much. All right. Bye for Thanks. now.